Oh, hey, okay. <laughs> Did we do it good? good? All right, we're live. Welcome to On Set. I am Daniel Norton. This is Marissa. All right, this is three, three, three? never fail lighting situations. So, so we're doing kind of the basics. In a way, right? We often play around here and we'll do a very specific idea, like a technique, like a how to you know, utilize this type of piece of equipment. And this time I'm gonna kind of show you some bread and butter stuff. So these are the kind of things that if you're in a pinch or you need to make a quick photo shoot and you don't really know who the subject is or you have to do a lot of different uh, uh, people in a day and you can't change it up a lot, these are lighting scenarios that work for most types of people. So we're gonna go through and create uh, three different looks essentially. Um, using the, the lights here. I will try to remember to say all the stuff I'm using as I go. I will probably forget. But I am Seth loaned me the Nikon 70 to 200 zoom. So for those of you who always think that my lens is not uh, the right focal length, this one's for you. So we're gonna zoom in with this. So yeah, we're gonna make some portraits. So the first one that we're gonna do is a, uh, like a kind of a variation on the three-point light. So when you have a three-point light, you basically got three types of, three sources of light. We're going to, in this case, we're going to do a key light, which is the main light lighting our subject's face, Marissa's face, this would be. Uh, a separation light, which is gonna be uh, like a hair light, essentially, and then we're gonna do a, a light on the background. So nice and simple, we'll walk through it, we'll take a few portraits, and if you guys have questions, let me know. Here we go. Yay. All right, so this is a gray background. People always ask us, this is the dove gray background from Savage. I, we should do like a, you should look at Vanna White thing where you're like. Savage. Savage. So that's a gray. I like a nice gray. I like dove gray. For the record, Seth does not like this one. He likes studio gray. Mm -hmm. But I got to pick this time, so. All right, so this is dove gray. It's got like a little bit of coolness to it, which I like. And uh, I think it offsets uh, a lot of skin tones. Not all skin tones, obviously, but uh, a lot of skin tones have warmth in them. We're having a coolish background will add some three-dimensionality to it. So it's a good place to start. If you're photographing people that have a cooler uh, skin tone, there are other types of gray that are a little bit warmer. Or you can go for something really neutral like fashion gray. Okay, so go ahead and stand about, yeah, there we go, that's good. All right, so this is a Brophoto B1X as my key light. For this, I'm gonna use a softbox. This is a two foot by three foot softbox from Profoto. It, people always ask me, what's the first modifier that, you should, that I should get? And if you are buying your first modifier for portraits, a two foot by three foot softbox, you really can't go wrong with. Yes, I have said that if you only had one thing, you might want like a three foot octa or whatever, but this is a good all around softbox to have. So a two foot by three foot is probably the first one I would get. So that's what we're gonna use here. You could get this one. Um, you could get one from Shmira. You could get one from, uh, I'm sure that uh, Glow, which is the internal company at Adorama, sells them at a, at a lesser price. What you're going to get with a softbox, uh, price-wise, point, point, price point-wise, why you'd pay more, basically, is that generally the more expensive ones will last longer. And when I say last longer, I'm not just talking about ripping, I'm talking about the color consistency. So you pay a little bit more for a softbox, like a Shmira, it's going to last a long time. Okay, so I'm gonna place this at roughly a 45 degree uh, ish angle from from the from the front. You know you want to place your zop box in this scenario about three ish feet away from them. I'm only shooting about a three quarter on her, and I want to put the center of the zop box slightly above eye level. Now, you don't uh, you can go much higher if you want. Depending on how high you raise it, it's going to change where the shadow from the zop box falls. Right. So if the light is really high, the shadow will go lower and lower on her, her face, down her nose. I don't want the shadow to cross her lip, ideally, so at least not too much. So raising it a little bit will give me that natural slant without getting it across her lips. Okay, so let's turn this on. Uh, this is in my C group for some reason because I'm backwards today, but that's okay. Um, over here, I'm going to switch to uh, TTL, which is through the lens metering. I'm going to take my A group and my B group, which are the other lights, and I'm going to turn them off. I'm gonna take my C group, leave it at zero. TTL is through the lens metering. What that means is that the camera meter is going to work with the lights to create ideally the correct exposure for us. I'm zooming in a little bit. We'll get kind of a nice shot like that. I'm doing a horizontal because you know this higher roll. All right, let's see what we get here. Okay, there we go. That is, uh, we're done. All right, 
See you guys next week. No, this is, this is good, right? Nice and clean. Okay. We've got... Um, her eyes really pop without having lasers coming out of them. <laughs> You've got, you know, but this is nice, right? It's nice clean light across her face. It's a fine shot. It's not finished though. So I definitely would want to add a little bit to this. Notice that I don't need any kind of a fill light with this because I'm raking the light across her face, feathering it as they say. You're gonna get some shadow on this side of the face, but that adds three dimensionality. In this particular scenario, we're not going for a flat light across the face. This is gonna make it good for most people, men and women alike. All right, so I probably now hid the whole set by putting the light over there, but that's okay. Next, we're gonna add the background light or the separation light. This one, I'm gonna put a grid on. This is a 30 degree honeycomb grid. What this is gonna do is it's going to uh, feather in the spread of the light grid and getting us, it doesn't give you a circle of light per se, like the way a, um, a snoot would do, but it gives you kind of a gradation down to the center. So we're gonna put this behind her. Let's point at the background. So again, we're not going for a perfectly evenly lit background. Is that the B group? It's in the B group, so I stuck my tape on properly. All right, so this one's in the B group. B for background. So I'm going to now take the B light and turn it on. Now, typically, we want to do each of our lights separately. So I'm going to take the C light. I'm going to turn it off. So this is going to give us probably not the perfect exposure because we're literally in the background with no other information. But let's just see what it gives us. Two shots for that. Look at that. Nice. Perfect. Marissa's done enough of these now that she knows that she can make a funny face when, when I shoot the background light because we won't see it. Yeah. However, what she doesn't realize is the dynamic range of the Nikon allows me to just pull it right back up. What? Bam. No. <laughs> <Exposed>. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> there you go. That's what they call dynamic range. <laughs> All right. Just in case you read somewhere that, that that camera doesn't have enough dynamic range. No, just... Z6 II. You know who owns the Z6 II? Marissa. That's right. All right. Did you move? Uh, I, just, I don't think so. Okay. Good. I feel like you moved a little bit. You, but moved, you moved a little bit. Come this way. Okay. Good. All right. Perfecto. That's good. Now, just to give you, a, to, uh, to show you what's going on, I'm going to turn on that light in the back. Now, because these lights are all set, I want to now switch to manual. And we'll just shoot with those two lights. Good. There we go, right? Now we've got some drama for your mama. Right? Like right here, you were like, that's pretty good. I'm a photographer. But now you're like, what? Right? Now we've got a little pop. And if we really want to, this is the key to photography right here, is that hair light. Now, if you want your images to be cinematic, you love that, right? Yes. When you, go to, when you get a subject in front of you, you're like, hey, would you, get, would you like some cinematic portraits? They're like, now, watch any movie. What does every movie have? A hair light. Most of the time, it doesn't make any sense, but they always have it. <laughs> it's like, where is that hair light coming from? I don't know, but it's fine. All right, so we're going to take our hair light. This is a strip box. We're going to kind of point it in this general direction. This one I'm keeping relatively flat. Uh, I'll throw the model in later. I don't know if you can see it from any of the cameras. No. Yeah, we're going to kind of shoot it across. It's always nerve wracking doing a hair light when Dave's hair because uh, Dave is known as Dave the hair light. Yes, that's what <laughs> Listen, you don't get to pick your own nickname. <laughs> Okay. All right, so here we go. We're gonna turn the, take the C light, turn it off, take the B light, turn it off. Take our A light, which is that light there, and I'm gonna put it back in TTL, and we're just doing the hair light, or separation light, as it would be. Nice. No. 
That is, in fact, a shot of her hair. Now, this you can only look at for a second and be like, okay, it's in the right position. What we're mostly looking for is that not too much of the light is coming around the front of her face and that she stays relatively... I mean, this is lit a little bit in the front because the hair light is bouncing off the soft box and filling in, right? So she's not a complete silhouette. However, enough of this isn't really filling in on the front. I'm not going to worry about the exposure yet. I think it's probably too bright. But before we do anything else... Oh, I'm so tall today. Well, you're so, everybody's so tall today except for me. Did I get shorter? I would like some heels. I want those heels that have like goldfish inside of them. <gasps> How cool would that be? Yeah. But a fake one. Because... Well, why fake ones? I would feed them. You don't think I can take care of goldfish? Okay. <laughs> like, hang out, they can feed my fish. <laughs> exactly. All right, I'm gonna go a little bit wider on this. And we're gonna come down a smidge. All right. Okay, here we go. This is all three lights in one place. It's almost like we've done this before. I think we've done this once or twice. So now, this has got a lot of dimension to it. We got nice bright light in her eyes. She looks very uh, elegant. 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 Her hair has a nice shine to it. The background has separation where her shoulders are. We're good. There's lots of variations you could do here. I was actually going to mess around with the background light, or the hair light rather, and turn it down, but I think it actually looks perfect. So we got there with TTL, and we got there really fast. I mean, if you, weren't, if you were doing this with a client and you weren't like doing a live stream and explaining everything, you could probably set it up really, really quickly. Now, with this, we can do a lot of different variations. If somebody had like a different hairstyle or whatever, we could turn that light up and down very simply and... But what I would say is once, if you're gonna do a whole day of shooting like this, look at your numbers, right? What matters here is that you, you've got your original setup. So we're at 5.2 in the front or whatever. Look at those so that if you start messing with them, you can go back to where you started. So that, that would be my advice. Um, all right, let's shoot a few like this. I like this. Any questions so far? I'm sorry. Can you read over? Yeah, over the whole setup, yep. Uh, By the way, Seth taught me that since, since Marissa has this camera, I can explain to her. There's like, when you do an eye, eye focus, <laughs> It's like on one of the eyes, and if you want to focus on the other eye, you just hit this little button, it goes to the other eye. It's almost like a video game. But there we go, right? Lots of things going on here. So, questions. I'm going to go over the whole thing one more time. We have three lights going on here, thus three-point lighting. We've got a key light. Your key light is your main light. This is a two-foot by three-foot softbox. It's set at roughly a 45-ish degree angle. It's about three feet or so away from her. This is giving us a nice light that wraps around her whole face. Again, I'm kind of, what they call feathering it, I'm letting it go past her so we don't really need a fill light on the other side. On a camera right, which is the subject's left, behind her we have a hair light or a separation light. That's a strip box, one foot by three foot. That's giving us a nice even light, which we see right here. And this is a lot, this is, this is a stylized portrait that's more cinematic, which I'll talk about in a second. So I'm letting this be a little bit bright. For some people's taste, that hair light might be a little bit too bright. You can turn it up and down. That's easy enough to do. But the third light in here is now our background light. That's lighting up our background. Clearly, there's a grid on there, a 30 degree grid. It's basically giving us that circle of light on the background. If we didn't have the grid, the background would just be pretty much evenly lit. Um, if we put on something like a snoot, let's say, you'd have a circle instead of a diffusion of light. So this looks more natural to me. So I like this look. The reason why it's nice to have three lights is it gives you a lot of control. Could I have just put her closer to the background and used one light to get that first look that we did here? You know, and still get the background brighter? Yeah, I could have, right? It, and that's the beauty of this, right? If you set this thing up and then you realize that one subject would look good without the background light, you can just turn it off. Like, watch. Background light is B. We'll turn it off. 
and there we go. Now we've got a darker background. Lots of variation. This is great to set up in a situation where you're going to have to repeat yourself. Now, when I say cinematic, <laughs> so I, I, I joke because people throw that around a lot when they're trying to sell you their presets, but <laughs> the thing is, if you look at movies, and I think a lot of photographers kind of got, la myself included, kind of got lazy somewhere in the 90s. Were you, you, were you born in the 90s? Yeah, it was Mercer, Mercer was around. The lazy yeah, yeah, she, she's, she's older, you know. So we got lazy, we were like, oh man, we don't need those hair lights. Uh, that's for old people. <laughs> but the reality is, is that using a light coming from the back gives you that separation, that pull. And, and, and I'm, I'm being serious when I say, if you watch movies, you will see good movies, of, like professionally shot movies with cinematographers, use lots of separation light. In fact, sometimes they have separation light and barely any light in the front. It helps give you that three-dimensionality feel. Cheap movies that somebody shot in their basement don't usually have that. Right? That's how you can tell the difference. So hair light, you get at least a B movie. <laughs> no hair light, C level. <laughs> okay, and the hair light could be the sun. I mean, you know, whatever. So there we go, right? And again, we can play around with this as far as like which lights we want to turn on and off and how we want to mess around with it. But basically, this is a nice, clean, fun light that we can use. It works for just about anyone. And to prove that point, Marissa's going to take my picture. Uh -uh. This is how I get my new pictures every year. There we go. There I am. I look cold for some reason. I was trying to look. I was trying to look tough, but instead I look cold. I think you look tough. Okay, I look toughly but cold. Yeah. I'm kind of like, what's going on? But see, this works for anybody. You get, my nose is large, so we got a little light on my nose. So we have to watch that. That was my posing. Bad posing from Daniel. Let me look right at the camera. You can't take a bad photo of Daniel. <laughs> oh yeah, I look right at the camera. Oh, chin out. There we go. There we go. That's the picture. Nice. Buy my presets. Buy his presets. <laughs> Woo! All right. That's one. We are only 20 minutes in. We've already knocked out one. Questions? Does that make sense? Thoughts? Concerns? Time to drink coffee. We are killing Why this. Why the background light go off? Oh, we turned it off. Mm hmm You want it back on? Yeah, you Jump up on the thing and press the press. Oh, yeah. I got this. Is it B? B, yep. So B and then head. We did the same setup in black studio rather than white. Would there be a noticeable change in the picture? Okay, I think I turned it off. Okay. <laughs> right, so yeah. there we go. Oh, you didn't get my thumbs in there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it zoomed? Hold on. Oh, no, okay. no, you don't have to zoom, just. Oh, okay. You got to pose. Oh, you got to pose the model. You got it. So, <laughs> the soft boxes of the shot, we'll, we'll, we'll Photoshop that. Uh... All right, one more. One more. <sighs> Marissa. Just, I'm a professional. Seth is watching this right now. He's not happy. All right, that's... <laughs> okay. There we go. That's the one. <laughs> that's the one. Buy my, buy my presets. Okay, well, I'm sorry. What was the question? Oh, if we, this was a totally black studio or a gray studio, would it make a difference? In this scenario, not much. And the reason why I say this is because we can see that in most cases, remember I shot one of each one of these lights separately. In most cases, the light itself didn't make much of a difference, right? We see that because the studio is, is a lighter color, partially, and because the softbox is here, we're getting some bounce back here. In other words, we're not getting total blackness. It's so minimal, I don't think it would make a difference. You might get a little bit more contrast in a dark studio, but I don't think it would make a difference in this setup. setup. Some setups, it will make a big difference, but not in this one. That's so good. It's a good one. All right. Okay, so, all right, so two, two good questions. How do we keep the reflection out of glasses? The angle of reflectance is equal, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflectance. In other words, in order for the camera to see a reflection on the glasses, 
the light would have to hit it and then bounce back at the same angle. So you just got to keep your chin up or down or turned away and that, that'll keep it away. The other way to do it would be to use a really large light source so that the entire glass essentially is full of light and then you wouldn't see a reflection. But the simplest way to do it is to just, I kept my chin down a little bit, basically. Um, oh, now I forgot the other question, which was a good one. Uh, does it have to be a strip? Oh, a strip box. Yeah, this is a very good question. You don't have to use a strip box for the back, for the hair light here. The thing is, is that whenever you're building your kitter setting up, you want to think a little bit about light control and also efficiency. So by using the strip box, I'm using less power, right? Because it's not having to fill an entire soft box. That's efficiency, but also control and spill. If I was using a wider soft box, more light would shoot out this way. Now I happen to be in a studio. It's not a huge deal. Although there is a white wall over here, right? So that's more stuff to bounce back and fill in if I don't want that. That goes back to that black studio, gray studio, white studio thing, right? If I had a black studio, a full-size softbox probably wouldn't make that much of a difference except eat up more light. But in this studio, a full-size softbox would likely give me more bounce back from the space. So I don't really want that. You could put a grid on it, like a, a honeycomb grid, which would help reduce that, you know, in that case. So that's why I like strips. In this case, you don't have to use a strip. There's gonna be the last setup that we do, I'll use a strip and you're gonna to wanna to use a strip for that. So this, you could get away with a regular softbox. All right, cool. So let's go to number two, we're killing it. All right, so this is gonna be more of a, this is what's called clamshell lighting. It's a pretty simple um, technique that we use. This one you could use for beauty type lighting, um, glamorous type lighting. It's, it's kind of gonna be a cleaner lighting with less shadow. Um, it would be a favorable type lighting for a female subject. Um, it doesn't have to be, obviously, it can work for anybody, but generally speaking, if I was photographing an entire day of beauty or female type subjects that I wanted more of a glamorous look, I would go with a clamshell. If I was photographing either more generic or primarily male subjects that I wanted a little more shadow and grit, I'd use the first one. So, um, yeah, let's do this. In fact, I just did a, a couple weeks ago, I did a, a, an entire live stream called uh, Masculine and Feminine Lighting. So if you want more on why you might use one or the other, check that one out and buy my presets. All right, here we go. <laughs> I don't have any presets. I had a preset and then I deleted it. <laughs> Not on purpose. All right, so this is where a C-stand comes in handy. You don't have to use a C-stand. You can work around it by getting the softbox close, whatever. I'm gonna use a C-stand because the C-stand is going to allow me to put the, the light out over top of her easier. So that, that's what we're gonna use here. This happens to have something, this arm on it is called a magic finger. People always ask that. That is the number one question besides which tripod I use, which this is a Manfrotto 055. Um, no matter what I do, I could do anything. I could use the most amazing piece of equipment in the whole world. Everybody wants to know about this magic finger. <laughs> because what's really cool about it is, w once I turn this knob here, there's a, essentially a joint and I can move the light around. So what we're gonna do is spin the light. Whenever you're using a C-stand, you wanna put the weight of it over the, 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 the high leg and you want to keep um, the sandbag on that same leg as well. So we're gonna spin this this way. Now the easiest way to work with this, in my opinion, is to do it while it's low and then raise it up. So, even though obviously Merce is taller than this. And also you don't need to boom it out a million miles, we just need to get it far enough out that the camera, it's not in the way of the camera. Okay. This is an older knuckle, so I just wanna make sure it's... Uh. Now if you are gonna drop a light on somebody, <laughs> this is a good one to drop because it's a soft box and thus it's Soft. It's not soft. From <laughs> step back for a second. Step back for a second. So. <laughs> it's not as soft as you would imagine. <laughs> Listen, if you take enough pictures, you will eventually drop a light on somebody. It's part of the, it's part of the nature of being a photographer. All right. All right, so I'm going to tip this one down. Now, because I'm gonna use an, what's called an active fill, that is another light as a fill, I can keep this at whatever angle I want. If you were using only a reflector underneath, we'd wanna really make sure the angle was steep. But I'm gonna keep it, this is probably pretty good. Uh, 
which one, which kind of strobes? Yeah, yeah, but are they? The actual strobes. So I'm using Profoto uh, strobes today. This one is a B1X, which is a 500 watt studio strobe, battery powered, and all that goodness. The other two, I believe, are both, yeah, the other two are both B10s. Profoto B10, um, they are 250 watt second, smaller, battery powered. I mean, I happen to have the B1Xs and the B10s. If you were starting a, a small portrait studio, I think the B10s are probably a good place to start, because people always ask that. These ones, the B1Xs, are, are real uh, workhorses, though. So if you're doing more of a commercial studio, I would recommend the B1Xs. That is not... Uh, necessarily the official Profoto line. I actually don't know what they recommend, but my experience is that's what I would recommend. All right. Yeah, come forward a bit. Good. Perfecto. It's always important, too, that when you're setting up these lights, that, number one, they're not perfectly level, because nobody wants a level light. And also that the logo is properly facing so that any cameras can see it. You've got to get that logo in there. Okay. All right, so we'll start with the one light, just like before. This again now is our key light. It's the same uh, light. So I'm going to turn off the other lights. I'm in the C group, which is that light, and I'm just going to fire that one light in TTL. Okay, so now we're getting... We see, the difference between this light and that one oh, is that in the first setup is that this one... You can see you've got a shadow to the side here shaping the face. This one, all of our shadow goes straight down, right? This butterfly light, as they say from the, the uh, as they say, as they say, um, is nice for giving a shape to the face. I'm going to back up a smidge with this, and I'm going to stretch my lens out to uh, 135. And that's because when you stretch the lens out like that, it's going to change the shape of the face slightly, um, which I think is going to be more appropriate to this. Okay, that looks nice. Now, real natural, real clean. It feels like kind of being outside on a cloudy day, right? Because you get that kind of overhead light, but yet it's kind of soft and, and, uh, and filling in. But we, let's say we want to have more control there, because even though this is pretty gentle, if we want to fill in, because let's say somebody's got imperfect skin or you just want to have that real glamorous look, we're going to add a secondary light. This light is going to be from the bottom, and that's why it's called clamshell light, because it's like clams. Yeah. Clams are also what uh, like 1920s gangsters call money. Really? Yeah, they'd be like... Yeah, that's going to be 10 clams. Exactly. <laughs> that's a lot of clams. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, is there a situation that you would sandbag the other end of that? No. I cannot think of a single time that I would ever want to do that. If you're putting that much weight on this arm that you need to put a weight on the other end of that, you shouldn't be using a C-stand, in my opinion. A 90 millimeter macro lens, uh, whether it be on a full frame camera or on a crop sensor, would be an excellent lens, I think, for portraits as far as focal length. Macro lenses tend to be really sharp, so it kind of depends on where you sit there. I don't like my portrait lenses to be super, super sharp, so I don't tend to go to macro lenses, but I know other people love macro lenses for portraits, so it kind of depends on the style that you have, but if that's if that's the lens you have, I would say use it. And then if you find that it is not, that it's too sharp, let's say, if you feel like me, then you could always upgrade at some point. I wouldn't immediately run out and get something else. Okay, so this is a Shamira Pro 2 Bank. And you can see that I had the light on backwards because I'm just trying to set it on there. What, what uh, we're gonna do with this is Trying to figure out how to do this to get it so it looks the best. It's always important that your lighting looks stylish. You don't want your, your subject to be like, why is your light not stylish? <laughs> there we go. The, the, the perfect clamshell, clamshell setup is when it's like, there's like that division between yourself and the, the subject so they can't come running at you if you just make a wise comment. 
Like, let's say, for instance, they had like a roundish face and you were like, oh, your face is kind of round. They might come charging at you. I'm talking about you, Sharina. Oh. All right. So now many people, now if you were using a reflector, you would put the reflector like here usually, right? Like real close and here. When I'm typically using an active fill, I want to fill in. I don't usually put the, the bottom of the clam right underneath. Because what's going to happen is if you start matching your ratios closer to one to one, you might risk this underneath like horror movie lighting, as they call it. Um, so we don't want that. So what I'm going to actually do is kind of put it almost from the front. It doesn't have to match the other light perfectly, but you want to get it you know, somewhat in the same range. That seems pretty good. So we'll just do this light by itself first so you guys can see what it looks like. Again, it's going to be my fill light. So I don't want it to expose her properly. Hmm. Or at all. Or at all, exactly. <laughs> Somebody's a wise. Somebody's a Weisenheimer. Well, it turns out that the B light, of course, is, is the background light, which is this one. All right, user error, here we go. All right, and because that Marissa would be a wise guy, I'm gonna leave this bad picture up for a while. Oh, look at how terrible that is. Oh, it's so bad. I know who you are in the comments, the one that always writes something about they can't be a bad picture of Marissa. Yeah, right now. So this is, now, now the thing is, if we leave this the way it is, it's going to be too flat probably, right? Because we're exposing her properly. We want our fill light to be darker than our key light, right? So I'm going to switch to manual now. I'm going to turn our key light back on. And I'm going to go up to my B light, this guy right here, the fill light. And I'm going to turn it down. I'm just going to start two stops. Because usually two stops under is a good place to be. But let's just see. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, two stops under is a good place. People always ask me that, and I say, oh, there's not really a thing. You've got to figure it out, but really, I'm lying. It's two stops under is, is where you... No, seriously, two stops under is a pretty good place. This is going to give us a nice flat light, which is going to give that, like, beauty pop. It's like... Wah, wah. Yeah. Uh, I might actually... So I'm going to actually give it one more tenth of... Uh, no, I'm going to go down one more tenth there. I'm going to bring my key light... I'm bringing both lights down one tenth. I'm going to stretch the lens out a little bit. Because this is more of a beauty shot, so I'm going to use a longer lens as I have it. This is what happens when somebody lets you borrow a lens. Next thing you know, you buy it. Yeah, there we go. All right, so now I'm stretched out to 200 millimeters. I've got both my lights turned down a smidge. She's looking really good. It's pretty much balanced. We do have a little bit of, if you notice right here, this is actually shadow from the under light, right? So it is a little bit weird, but people like that stuff in beauty shots. Yeah. yeah. See, nobody noticed it until I pointed it out. I mean, I can actually see it with my eyes because the light's bouncing off the floor. It's natural. It looks that way. I'm going to actually turn my key light up, which is C, two tenths. We'll take one more shot. Oh, I'll do it without cutting off the whole top of her head. There we go. There it is. Whenever you're cutting off the top of somebody's head, you gotta do it in the right spot. Right, now this is pretty darn good as it is, but again, the more light you use, the more you get paid. Now we don't want this to have just a separation light, because this is more like a beauty shot. You don't see, when you, watch, when you look at beauty ads, they don't often have the hair light, right? That's cinematic, we want beauty. So we're gonna light the background. And I'm gonna light it using kind of a, a style of light that I've never used before, because why wouldn't I do that live in front of a studio audience? <laughs> this is not bucks. I'm gonna take my strip bank. Typically when you're deciding how to light something, if you just take whatever light you have sitting around, that's usually the right one. And I'm going to point it up at the background like this. 
Yeah, I once saw Joe McNally do something like this. Yeah, yeah, I have done before actually. It's true, he copied me. That guy. <laughs> All right. I'm not even going to test it. I'm just going to go for it. Ah, there we go. I got to work on my composition a little bit here because I think I again need to. So what we've got is wow, this is really nice. It's almost too nice for you, Marissa. Too nice for me. Too nice for you. All right, I'm going to raise the camera up a smidge because I backed up a little bit and it changed my perspective. All right, so here we go. Let's just see what that looks like. Uh, try to, can you work? Oh, no, that's, oh, I see. This is your good side. Let me go this way. Marissa wants to look that way. <laughs> so I moved. I, I switched sides. <laughs> there we go. Right. You've gotten tall for some reason. There we go. Good, good, good. Project. Beautiful. Nice. Ooh, good. Nice. All right. Pretty, beautiful, soft, autumn morning. She, <gasps> Right? She's out there on the cloudy autumn morning, waiting for her first cup of coffee. It's glorious. But this is, this is a beautiful kind of glamorous light that's not over the top, right? It's not like in your face. This is really, really good for, I get lots and lots of comments. People write me stuff all the time, besides asking me about the magic finger and the, and the tripod. <laughs> what do I do with older subjects? How do, you know, especially ones they want to cover up? We had this discussion. You're we don't want to cover up the wrinkles, but if you want to, this is going to be really flattering for most people. It's going to make the light real soft, real pretty, real kind of creamy, uh, and even <laughs> smooth. Oh, would I use a gel on the fill light? I did make a video like that and it didn't get that many views. So I'm going to say no. No, you can. I mean, sometimes if you're going for, okay, so there's different types of portraits, right? Be, this, this, in this case today, we're kind of going for these like kind of, I don't want to call them generic because they're all really nice, but they're kind of like very kind of like universal. So I wouldn't just throw a gel on this. If I was making a very specific portrait of a certain person with a certain vibe, I might do that. Warming this up a little bit, for instance, could allow it to feel like like light kind of bouncing off the floor. It feels very natural to have this kind of warm fill. Not crazy warm, but a little bit. Um, you know, you definitely can do that. I think in this case, I would not do it because I like the entire vibe of this. It's very cool, so I wouldn't in this particular portrait. But sure, just don't go overboard. You know, if you're looking to warm this up, maybe like a, a light bastard amber or something like that would be all you'd want. You don't want to go crazy with like a full CTO or some crazy thing like that. Um, because we're going for like a softer, flatter, right? This is flat, flat light. Versus, you know, try to find an equivalent. One more immerse is being serious. Wow, oh, serious. Right. Two different kinds of styles of light, right? Kind of soft versus more shaped and, and you know, precise. Like this one, the, the lighting we're doing now could are the police after you this time or me? This could even have that feel of, oh, God forbid, it almost looks like natural light because it's so flat, right? And that's a, when people think of natural light, they always think of flat, which is most natural light is not flat, yeah. which is weird. But, you know, fall morning, kind of in the, uh, sitting on the front porch, cup of tea, right? Soon. Pumpkin spice. Oh my God, I just realized that these two cups of coffee look like glasses. I just realized that too. <laughs> that is so nuts. Wow. And about coffee and breakfast. <laughs> yeah, now we have logo design. Questions? Did I, did I answer the question? I, I got, oh, about the gel. Yeah, I like gels. <laughs> Marissa um, loves gels. You don't like to catch lights. Well, then you don't like to clamshell. They don't like clamshell. If you want this style of light with no catch lights or no two catch lights, what you've got to do is stop worrying about catch lights. <laughs> I mean, 
I'm not sure. I, I don't buy into the whole catch light world, so I don't care about that. But if you, first of all, if you have no catch lights in eyes, they just look unnatural and weird. You always have a catch light in your eye. She's got catch lights in her eyes right now. I'm standing here looking at her in this room, and she has three of them, actually. <laughs> so catch lights are completely, completely natural. People who tell you they're not, they're wrong. But if you want really flat light with no catch lights, what you would need to do is set up a very large source, like let's say behind the photographer. That's also very 90s. In the 90s, we loved our seven foot Octobanx. Put that thing behind you, stand in front of it with the, with the Pentax six by seven and some Tri-X. All right. But yes, if you don't like the catch lights, then you need to take, because remember the eye, just like glasses, to go back to the glasses thing, your eye is roundish. I think it's perfectly round. My eyes are not round, but your eyes are round and they reflect light. So if I have a light source coming in at my eyeball, it's going to reflect out. But if I have it at such an angle that the reflection goes away from the camera, you won't see it. So like a big source in front usually does that. Like it won't bounce right back at you, if that makes sense. Cool. That was two, right? That was two. So the third one is a little bit more when you want to do something a little more, I, I believe, interesting, but it's not kind of the standard one. Like I think your, your, the first lighting we did is probably the most standard. This second one is probably good for, again, if you're doing a very specific thing, uh, older people, somebody, you know, something a little more glamorous. The third type that we're going to use is very kind of more, um, uh, what was that? Artsy. We'll call it artsy. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's something that you might do with somebody. I do it all the time. What ends up happening is somebody hires you to come in to make a portrait and you do that first one because that's the most basic one and then they're super happy with it and then you do this one and this is the one they really like, which is what we're gonna do now. But they, they have to use the first one, <laughs> which is a profile. I love profiles. If this is your first time watching, get used to it. <laughs> Daniel loves a good profile. We're gonna make a profile shot of Marissa. She has to look this way by contract. Yeah, that's, that's her good side. Bad side. Bad side, good side. This is why the cameras, every, this entire studio is designed around the fact that this is Marissa's good side. <laughs> Can you make them look older? Sure. What you would do to make somebody look older, Marissa will kill me if I do that, is you would bring this light more overhead to emphasize the wrinkles and not fill in from below. I think we did a video on it. Yeah, we did that once. Don't you dare. She will not let me do it. I, sorry, guys. It's in Marissa's contract that she could not look older. Now that she's getting older. I know. So old. she, she was just a child when we first met. All right. That's okay, though. We all get older. <laughs> I'm like the character from Street Crime Diet. Blanche, like, hiding the shadow. <laughs> it, it, it's like what Seth always says to me, that no matter how old he gets, I'll still be older than him. So you'll still always be younger than me, so that's a good place to be. All right. I don't mind. No. I, you, well, never mind. See how she just told me I could do it after I put everything away? It's wow. Late. We'll do that for another thing. We'll do a character one coming up, so be ready for that. Whether or not it's Marissa, we'll try to get Marissa back. So I usually get to Marissa, you know, she's a, a star, rising star in the, the film world. She's a shooting star. Don't you know? All right. All right, so we're gonna have her profile this way. Now, this is where I said before, you're gonna to wanna to use a strip bank because I really wanna have control over where this falls because this is gonna allow us to create the level of drama that we want. So I'm gonna set this guy up. And what I wanna do is kind of keep it Level, level to her face, so that the center of it is roughly in the, cent in the center of her, her face. You can go a little higher if you want, but roughly in the center is where you want to be. And we're going to go relatively close. We're going to go close because we want to use the inverse square law. Right? The inverse square law states that you don't know what the inverse square law is. Nobody really knows what it is. <laughs> we just say it a lot. No, but basically, it t this, the long and short of it is that something that's closer to the light is going to be brighter and then something that's further away. And the closer the light is to the subject, the more dramatic that will be. So if I light, if I keep the light really close to Marissa, if the front of her face is gonna be lit, the back is gonna be dark. 
if I took the light and put it far away, then her whole head would be lit evenly. That's the long and short of the inverse square law. It doesn't just apply to light, by the way. It applies to, I think, every wavelength. The scientists in the audience will tell me. Every, not wave, every wave form, not wavelength. Okay. Okay, so we're going to frame up a nice... Oh, I got all kinds of space here. I think we get that much closer. So we're going to move this in. Okay. Oh, yeah, it's right at the edge of the frame. I can see it. So as usual, we're going to start with a single light. Because there's no way I could make this last an hour if I didn't do that. <laughs> Adam Rama pays me by the minute. All right. No, I'm just kidding. All right, so we are going to shoot this. This is the A light. So I'm going to turn off B and turn off C. And here we go. We're going to have to adjust our hair and stuff, but I just want to get a basic idea. OK, that is very bright because I left it in manual. So let's try that again. Oh, I didn't tighten my. Oh, I like that, actually, with the hair there. OK, chin up out a little bit. There we go. Like a chicken, good. Nice. There we go. OK. So here, we're going to get these kind of almost translucent eyes, where they're almost like there's glowing, like there's lasers coming from them. Because the light is going through the eye, right? As opposed to reflecting off of it. And we're going to be able to control the amount of contrast or darkness on the camera side by moving the light or the subject, we'll do the light, forward and back. Once we've established our exposure, which I actually think is pretty good. I, I, when I do this technique, I like it to be bright. If this is too bright for you, uh, we could dial it back a little bit. Like, that's probably OK. We could go down about a third of a stop. So I'm going to come over here, because I know you guys are looking at it and saying it's too bright. But remember the dynamic range of this camera. I showed it to you earlier. All right. All right, so I'm going to dial this down a third of a stop. We'll do one more test shot. There we go. Now, if we want to create more darkness, which is what I want, on the side of the face towards the camera, I'm going to take this light, which is pretty much right now centered on her, and I'm going to move it so that the edge of it is more or less at her nose. Right? Now, the light, when it comes out of the soft box, is going to spread out. So it's not like she's going to be completely dark on the side, but it will definitely make a difference. Yeah, see? Mm, all right, OK. Good, good, good. All right, so we're going to get a good established spot. And that will give us the shadow that we want. And we can notice that, again, look at, look at her eye is shining right through, right? Now, the more light you use, the more you get paid, right? So we're not just going to do one light here. Although, in about six months, I'll probably do one of these, and it'll be called single light photo, and I'll probably do this picture. So get ready for that. No, I would do it different if I was on it. So let's add extra lights. I'm going to, I, would I, would my plan originally, yeah, let's stick to the original plan. I'm sticking to the original plan, Marissa. I'm just going to take the full-size softbox. And I'm essentially going to set it up the same way. Hmm. Oh, man, somebody has this the wrong way. Okay. Seth watches these videos back in slow motion to make sure that all the C-stands are set up correctly. So we're going to take this guy, and we're going to basically set it up the same way. I mean, honestly, actually, there's no sense in life to make things more difficult than they need to be for yourself. Last year for Christmas, Marissa got me a, a, a second one by three. 
I was gonna use the full size softbox and then mess around with it for 10 minutes, but let's just do it right. Hold that please. The double strip kit can be purchased uh, from my website. The website is called adorama.com. <laughs> no, there's no, I mean, it probably is a double strip, but I wish it was my website. All right. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna use the second strip and we're basically gonna do the same thing. Now these are color coded. They're red. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, so you look here. Yeah, exactly. You really want to build it? Sure. It's always important to have Marissa build stuff. Questions, thoughts, concerns? Uh, yeah, is that called rim lighting? Is this called rim lighting? No. Rim light would be closer to what we did at the beginning. The thing is, is that your separation slash hair slash whatever light is called a million different things, and one of those things is a rim. So if you were to have two of these, that would be rim lighting in my mind anyways. This is called Daniel's double enchilada. <laughs> what kind of PC requirements is there for tethering? That is something that you would probably need to look up on Capture One's site. I do not know. Um, and there are a bunch of different PCs. However, you probably don't need much of a PC to tether if, uh, if you can run something like Lightroom, then you probably can do it. So if you are running Lightroom currently, you probably can tether. Um, will it be crazy fast? Maybe not. Um, I mean, personally, uh, I've been able to tether on my, I got one of those, what's that computer I just got? The one you're using there? The MacBook M Air thingy? Really fast. Yeah, oh, they're fast, okay, so yeah. <laughs> uh, but you don't need a very powerful laptop to for tether, it'll just be slow. Um, but I would look on Capture One's website for their exact specs of what you need, because I wouldn't want you to, to get Capture One and not be able to use it. And I believe, you can still download Capture One from their website um, and you get a 30 day free trial. So if you're unsure, wow, that is some hair going on there. That's like a, like a, you could be in like a 1980s fantasy movie with that hair. <laughs> All right. I like this. I like the amount of uh, light we're getting on your hair. However, I want more shadow here. So, and that shadow is being filled in, we know, by the second light. So, I mean, I am going to move this over a little bit. Um, and again, same thing. I'm going to position it based on how much shadow I want in the front. This is where a grid would be useful. And the reason why I say that is because then I could leave the light where it was. There we go. That actually worked, though. Um, and now we're getting this, like, sweeping lioness. Well, I guess lionesses don't have mains. So, lion. lion. She's a lion. Right, and this is a little more dramatic. And this is the kind of thing that you can throw in at the end of a session that's got a bit of drama that people like. They're like, oh, that's really cool. I'm really cool. And, you know, I feel so cool right now. I can't see your hand because it's oh, off the screen. This is my Italian. She's trying to show off her, her nails. Now we can see that when she does that, her hand looks what? Terrible, because it's too close to the light. Marissa has inadvertently shown you how the inverse square law works. <laughs> right. All right, so let's, let's shoot if you like this with nothing. That's it, powerful, chin out, good. Out, good. Good. What? I do not have grids to the strip boxes. Cliff, send me some grids. <laughs> no, I don't have grids to the strip boxes. I am gridless. I used to. I think that um, grids are useful, but not essential. You know. 
you will find that sometimes if you don't have a grid, that you might be somewhat limited. Like I had to move the light back, right? So probably I'm not getting the hair exactly as the place where I would have got it if I had the grid. So I had to compromise a little bit in positioning, but it's pretty darn good. Pretty darn good. All right, so. Forward. I'm so close to the light. There you go. All right, I'll do this in some more. There we go. Nice. There we go. Nice. And we see that even with the light directly at it, there's not really a, a reflection. I mean, you can see this is actually the reflection of my face. There's not a glare off the glasses, and that's because light moves in a straight line. If it's coming here, bouncing off my glasses, it's just going right back. It's not coming this way. So, but if I go like this, now we'll be able to do it. Like this will probably put it, like that's gonna put a reflection on. No, even that's not bad. There we go. You can never get a reflection on your glasses. Actually, it's because I'm so close to it. Yeah, see, this, this whole eye is reflected. And we got it right there. And there you go, versatility. Reflection. Nice. Questions, thoughts, concerns. Wow, I really came in exactly at six o'clock. I'm getting good at this uh, timing wise. Questions, thoughts, concerns. Nope. Wait a second. Do people want to see Marissa shoot more? You know, a delay. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, there's a delay. Do you want to see Marissa shoot Dave? <gasps> Wait till laser eyes. Laser eyes, you could have done it. All right, guys, I think we got it. Unless any questions come at the very end. It's good, right? So you can take these three as examples, but it's good to have some things in your pocket, right? I, I always say that you should light everybody individually, which is what I believe, because everybody is different, right? But as you develop certain styles, you'll find some that kind of work for a lot of different types of people. And those are the ones you wanna always have in your back pocket. So if you need to go in and shoot some kind of portrait, whether it be, okay, I gotta go in and photograph 10 people for this company for their annual report, so I don't have time to do a bunch of different setups, or you just photographing one person, but you've never seen them before, or you don't know how much time you have, you can fall back on these things. Do the one that you know that's gonna work first, then start working and manipulating, right? Get the person to feel comfortable. They're like, okay, hey, that's a really cool shot. You got it hey, let's try something. Then you can try your funky laser eyes and gels and all kinds of other things. But you wanna know that you've got that one good shot that they definitely can use before you do anything else. So I'll put Marissa's information, actually I'm just gonna tell you, marissa.roper, follow her. Somebody write it in the chat. I'm Daniel Norton, photographer, you can follow me. Subscribe to the channel, ring the bell if you haven't already. We'll be back in two weeks with another uh, demo like this. If there's something you want to see in these demos, let me know. Um, and I will try to incorporate it. And uh, thanks to Dave. And thank you to my loyal listeners. So loyal. You are so loyal. Thank <laughs> you. Did I curtsy? I think so. With your cargo pants. My cargo pants. Th these actually become shorts. Because I had another.